What comes to mind first when you think of Ratchet & Clank Future, A Crack in Time? Is it the gorgeous visuals, the open space exploration, or the breathtaking vistas? How about the beloved, often heart-wrenching character moments that are still considered the strongest in the series? Is it that larger-than-life feel, that energy of a special piece of art that's greater than the sum of its parts? For me, it's none of these. The first thing I think of with this game is its Insomniac Museum, the secret bonus area that acts as a warehouse full of early ideas and cut content. More specifically, I think of this area here, an entire village that would have been full of characters, side quest puzzles, and world building, a section of a crack in time that was just about finished, but due to a lack of time, couldn't fit into this game's scope. I think of all of this game's new mechanics, reintroduced concepts, features that showed incredible promise, promises that are never fully brought to their logical conclusion. I think of how half of this game's written dialogue, 10,000 lines, were left on the cutting room floor thanks to a rushed production cycle, the consequence of years of crunch and overambition across every Insomniac project in the decade prior. I think of this lost potential, the potential of an all-time great Ratchet game, hell, likely an all-time great game, period, that we never got to see, that they deserved to be able to deliver. Now, I make it a point to never judge a game for what it could or should have been. That's not fair. Every game developer would go back and add, tweak, and fix if they could. The rolling theme of every Ratchet game so far has been, man, this is so good, but what if they took their time? This just happens to be the game where time finally caught up to them. The fact that the team tried this hard with less than a year of production time, that so many new features were introduced after years of the same thing with a different coat of paint, that this game ended up being as good, as relatively polished, and as beloved as it still very much is, is incredible. Try as you might, you can't take that away. But what I do try to do is judge a game by its own goals and achievements, what the team set out to do, and how well the resulting product does those things. And where countless players see the best Ratchet & Clank game, I've looked for years, I've tried. I see and I do understand what folks love about this game, but I don't see a diamond. I see the cracks where this game bends and breaks under such an immense prolonged pressure, and that hurts. That sucks. I don't have many behind-the-scenes development stories for you this time, because this game's story was forecasted by the last six. You could try to go back in time and change it all you want, but this was always going to be the result. For a long time, this was widely considered the last great Ratchet & Clank game. For me, it's always been another good one. But at least now, over a decade later, I finally understand why I feel that way, why I've been the odd man out, and I hope that you'll hear me out. This is the story of reward over consequence. This is Ratchet & Clank Future, a crack in time. Nice work. Couldn't have left a few for me, hmm? Reward over consequence, right? You're a fast learner. Come on, we're almost there. I've beaten this game probably ten times, three of them in the last couple weeks. I've essentially 100% completed it from a fresh file twice, with a few more runs that have come pretty close, but this exchange never stuck out to me until I was finally ready to give a crack in time the Golden Bolt special. It's a phrase that Ratchet pins onto General Alistair Azimuth, the first other Lombax that our hero has ever met. Shut up, don't talk about it. It's a phrase used to describe this new Lombax's fighting style and strategy, the astute analysis of a man who's lost everything, who caused the death of his best friend and the fall of his species, of a broken man who will go to whatever lengths to undo what he feels is the greatest mistake in the history of the universe. These three words, reward over consequence, are the essence of Azimuth. They're the central conflict of A Crack in Time's plot, and, to me, 
They also describe the game itself, the product of one of the only studios that was still churning out yearly, high-quality games well into the HD era, as countless other studios collapsed under higher expectations and lower margins. A studio who, after years of maybe feeling passed over, wanted its flowers, wanted the recognition it deserved. At this point, it was expected that Insomniac would just keep banging out games annually. A Crack in Time was their ninth game in eight years. That's never changed either. This studio is responsible for like half of the PS5 games in its first year on shelves, or I guess not on shelves. Insomniac has always been seen as a good hand, quietly doing their thing, popping out B-plus games with frightening frequency. But as I detailed throughout all of my prior Ratchet & Clank retrospectives, this journey wasn't rosy. I've spoken to former Insomniacs that worked 80-plus hour weeks with no overtime pay. I've detailed stories of developers staying at the office for multiple days on end. I've been told that the very top of this company at one point allegedly said, that if you didn't work weekends, you probably didn't have a future at Insomniac. And there are worse stories of this era of Insomniac that I still can't tell. In their own post-mortem reflections on some of these Ratchet games, project leads have outright said that there was crunch, that they couldn't hire or keep enough programmers, that they had to pull staff from one project onto another frequently. This studio clearly, at its highest levels, wanted a game out every single year. Part of that is surely because, as an independent company, that's how they pay the bills. But they put reward over consequence. One of these such consequences was staff turnover, and this brings about a story that I haven't been able to fully tell you yet. Allegedly, one of Ratchet 2 and 3's lead gameplay programmers quietly scouted some of his co-workers to gauge interest in starting their own company so that they could produce these sorts of games more freely without such an oppressive crunch culture. Around the time of Ratchet 3's pre-production, Insomniac found out about this, and the best that I've been able to glean from there is that there were legal threats or legal action of some sort. That programmer was quickly ousted from the company, and a year later, he founded High Impact Games, the studio that later made the PSP Ratchet & Clank games using a significant amount of former Insomniac staff, many of whom seem to have left due to the pressure of making increasingly larger games on an increasingly quick basis. Obviously, Crunch was a part of that era, for better or worse. You could comb most companies' entire libraries and find maybe one or two games that didn't have some form of Crunch up until recently. And to Insomniac's credit, across all of these Ratchet games that I've covered so far, there was one recurring goal internally, that the studio would get better at managing these projects so that sooner or later, they could be this prolific without needing to Crunch. Based on every indication, A Crack in Time wasn't the game where this finally happened. The PlayStation 3's Ratchet & Clank Future Saga was intended as a way for the series to grow up with its players, an ambitious, multi-game story arc that would explore many of the questions that fans had about this expanding universe and cast of characters. As I explained in the first Future Retrospective, though, this entire saga was marred from the very start by ambitions and hiccups. Early on, somebody at the studio excitedly promised to Sony that the first PS3 Ratchet game, 2007's Tools of Destruction, was going to have some form of split-screen co-op as well as the return of online multiplayer from the previous two PS2 Ratchets. When I spoke to one of this game's lead programmers, he didn't ever recall hearing about such a concept, and as a huge proponent of co-op, he was pretty confident that he would have remembered such a pitch. When full production began, it was clear that the multiplayer ambitions just weren't gonna happen, and somebody at Insomniac then promised to a disappointed or perhaps upset Sony that they would put out a downloadable PSN Ratchet game of some sort to make it up to them. The problem was, they already had Resistance 2 slotted for a 2008 release, and Ratchet & Clank Future 2 was already locked in for 2009. So this future saga midquel known as Quest for Booty would end up having its production eat into the pre-production for the game that we're talking about today. The hope was that they could use Quest for Booty as a way to somehow slingshot right into the next game and have a running start. That didn't happen. A Crack in Time was supposed to be a two-year project, because even Insomniac knew that making an HD game in a year's time wasn't possible like it was back on the PS2. 
Thanks to this scrambling, these promises and make goods, they ended up having less than a year. I've heard as little as nine to 10 months of proper production and pretty much no pre-production, again, thanks to Quest for Booty. Hope it was worth it. I'm a little teapot, short and stout. And to take it back another step, remember that this was supposed to be a sweeping multi-game story arc. Dedicated Ratchet fans will recall the name TJ Fixman. This was the guy who wrote every Ratchet on the PS3 and the PS4, as well as a six-issue Ratchet & Clank comic, the first draft of the Ratchet & Clank movie before Hollywood got involved, and, well... <laughs> This was the man tasked with writing the story bible of the series, compiling all the previous lore from the PS2 games and throwing it all together for future story ideas. Fixman joined Insomniac as a QA tester for Resistance, Insomniac's first PS3 game, and about a year before Tools of Destruction was released, he was brought over to Ratchet thanks to his writing background. Fixman, formally, was actually listed as a co-writer for this game. We know him as the writer now, but that's a retroactive change. That's because despite doing the bulk of the story work, Fixman was brought onto Ratchet after the departure of the game's original listed writer, Adam Moore, due to creative differences of some sort. What kind of differences exactly? I, I don't know, people don't respond to my emails anymore. By the time Fixman was thrown into the fire, Tools of Destruction already had all of its framework designed, with little to no actual story to connect this tissue. All of the levels were mapped out, new characters such as Talwin, the game's villain Emperor Tachyon, even the mysterious race of time-warping creatures known as the Zoni, they were all modeled and in-game. Fixman had to put together Tools of Destruction's story in a matter of months, using characters and plot points that weren't his. He had to set up little teases and hooks for Future 2, only to find out at some point that there was another Future game that he had to write before he could even get to Future 2. He was also tasked with writing Resistance 2, and remember that he was responsible throughout all of this time for compiling a story bible for any potential Ratchet games after the Future series, including characters from the PS2 games that he wanted to bring back, such as Sasha and Skid McMarks and the Q-Force in general. In other words, at any point from 2006 to 2009, this dude was juggling as many as four different game scripts across two different franchises, and he started on his back foot. This was, remember, his first professional writing gig. The fact that he ended up putting together even a half-decent story arc, let alone what many consider the most compelling Ratchet story with this game, A Crack in Time, is marvelous. Regardless of the issues and critiques that I have with any of these games, I will never take this game or this saga's achievements lightly, and neither should you. This is all crucial context to understanding how amazing it is that A Crack in Time isn't an absolute dumpster fire, and it's also the context I need to give this disclaimer, it's likely not as good as you remember either. Don't get me wrong, it's still good, but this game's been on a sort of pedestal for over a decade now due to its ability to drive emotion in a few key moments, due to being the first game since Ratchet & Clank 2 to really introduce anything new, and due to many players' belief that it was the last Ratchet & Clank game to run at 60 frames per second up until recently. But the story structure, as much as I like it conceptually, is flawed and leads to a very uneven pace. It doesn't satisfyingly answer pretty much any of the questions that the first future game set out to ask, leaving fans in limbo for, again, over a decade. This game does not run at 60 frames per second. We all just thought it did because it was 2009 and none of us knew what good frame rates were when most games were barely hitting 30. This game averages less than 45 and I did the analysis, but I'll save that for later. And the gameplay for as many cool new features as it introduces or brings back, it's overall pretty mid. When it hits well, this game is unparalleled, but thanks to all of those thousand cuts, your imagination has to fill in the blanks a lot of the time, and that's exactly what it did for so many of us. At the very least, Fixman totally hit his stride when it came to humor and with writing a few of his own brand new characters, as well as returning favorites such as Captain Quirk. What a shocker, when the guy's not saddled with other people's work, he does a pretty good job. Where in Tools of Destruction, Quirk's character had regressed after having such a great story arc with the PS2 games, here he's back in top form, often funnier than ever. 
What's your name? The child. Hurl yourself into this laser wall as hard as you can. He even brings back his old penchant for infiltration and disguise. Looks like he finally got some use out of that old personal hygienator. When you put all of a crack in time's development hurdles into perspective, it makes the game we did end up getting all the more impressive. Go ahead and save this timestamp, by the way, for when you get mad about something I say later. Despite only having about four more months of full development than Quest for Booty, a game that I have to remind you is only a smidge over two hours long, this one is still commonly considered one of the longest Ratchet and Clank games. I mean, it's not, but that's part of the magic of A Crack in Time, that it does a stellar job of hiding from most players that it's shorter, and for those same players, covering up a lot of this game's shortcomings. See, due to Insomniac having to rebuild the DNA of Ratchet and Clank from scratch with the jump to the PS3, Tools of Destruction ended up being a pretty safe game by design. I mean, the very name Tools of Destruction is a reference to all the hell they went through rebuilding their engine and development tools, again, from scratch. The team thus set its sights even as far back as 2006 on making Future 2 the PS3's equivalent to Going Commando, this huge coming out party that would either re-revolutionize the series or later when they were faced with a bit of internal Ratchet and Clank burnout and slumping sales, a big bang to maybe end this franchise. Features like Ratchet 2 and 3's fully explorable mini-moons made their triumphant return, a little reminder in a post-Mario Galaxy era that Ratchet did spacey gravity based gameplay first. The studio even worked together a series of freely explorable space hubs to connect this tissue to help give the Ratchet universe that feeling of being a living world of its own, which was the original MO of the series. And it helped lean into the growing trend of RPG elements, side quests, etc. that had really started taking over games in the early HD era. At least a few folks at Insomniac have admitted that they were playing a lot of GTA when the idea came up for free-roaming flying and space radio. This sort of stuff is to a great extent exactly what a lot of the dedicated Ratchet & Clank fanbase like myself had been asking for, because the world that was built up in those earlier games was so convincing that people wanted to get more absorbed in it. However, what I don't like about this is that most everything in A Crack in Time to me feels half-baked, because it is. It didn't get nearly enough time in the oven, that is a fact. In Ratchets 2 and 3, the Insomniac Museum mostly featured early concepts and ideas that rarely left the whiteboard, early versions of what weapons or gadgets might have looked like before the models were changed. Some things were cut, but usually whatever made it past pre-production stayed in. In A Crack in Time, there are entire bosses, weapons, and areas that were worked on, even polished, that had to be cropped out because cuts had to be made just to meet the ship date. It's a strong game for about one playthrough, in my opinion, which really is all that most games need and it's all that most players will ever complete. Since Ratchet's always been about replayability, however, I've noticed that the more that I've played A Crack in Time, the more the gap grows between what this game set out to do and what it actually does, and the more I notice that if you put all of the Future Saga's goals in a single checklist, adding meaningful improvements to the tried-and-true Ratchet gameplay, telling a weaving story that flows through multiple games, and answering questions like explaining who Ratchet is, who Clank is, and what happened to the Lombaxes, I don't feel that they satisfyingly checked off any of these boxes, at least not completely. Let's break down those issues by starting first with the story. A Crack in Time takes place two years after the ending of Tools of Destruction, when Clank was taken away by the mysterious Zoni, leaving Ratchet without the only family he's ever known. Ratchet then spent about a year searching for his buddy's location with the help of his girlfriend Talwin, who, by the way, is not featured in A Crack in Time. Yeah, she's mentioned, like, twice. Two, <laughs> two times, after being one of the driving parts of both Tools and Quest for Booty's stories. I guess the team either didn't want to draw attention to the fact that they just completely dropped the plot thread of Talwin's missing father, or they felt they already had too many hero figures at once and that it might get too jumbled or confusing, which is understandable on such a short development schedule, but makes me wonder why there are four enemy factions. Uh, well, whatever. Anyway, at the end of Quest for Booty, after completing a bunch of filler errands, Ratchet is able to track Clank's location to the Brigus Nebula, a dangerous sector at the very edge of the galaxy. 
Now, Ratchet & Clank games tend to take place according to the real world's passage of time. In other words, if two games are released one year apart, there's about a year canonically in between the events of said games. This would then mean that Ratchet took a full year to prepare to save his best friend, instead of immediately heading over there now that he finally had a lead. So, for this game's benefit, I'm gonna say this takes place immediately after Quest for Booty, because, well, otherwise we're off to a rough start, and I would rather be as fair as I possibly can. To its credit, A Crack in Time's opening is one of the highest budget and most exciting in the entire franchise, because after two years, we finally start getting proper answers to Tools as Cliffhanger instead of a $15 second cliffhanger, because we start this game as Clank. For the past couple years, Clank has been held unconscious, a captive of the returning fan-favorite villain, Dr. Nefarious. This entire time that Ratchet's been searching for his pal, his nemesis had tricked the Zoni into holding Clank hostage while he probed Clank's brain, looking for the location of something called the Orvis Chamber. This was actually teased deep in the background during Tools of Destruction, but Dr. Nefarious at some point during that game's plot finally escaped the asteroid that he'd been trapped on ever since the end of Ratchet 3, crash landing onto a planet inhabited by a race called the Fongoids. These Fongoids worshipped the Zoni as gods, and the Doctor quickly learned that the Zoni were the keepers and protectors of time itself, using this massive, otherworldly great clock. So Nefarious bowed his time, he fooled the Fongoids into slavery, he got the Zoni to capture Clank for him, and he prepared a master plan, not to rule the universe as he'd tried in the past, but instead, a plan of revenge. Get the clock under my control. I'll be able to wrong all the rights in the universe. Every villain who has ever stumbled will get a do-over. Every protagonist's triumph will be reversed! Until finally, a new present is created, in which the heroes always lose! <laughs> I like that he just acknowledges that he's evil. Throughout all this time, however, Dr. Nefarious wasn't able to find the key he was searching for within Clank's mind, and with his saint-like patience wearing thin, he decides to finally betray the Zoni. In doing so, he accidentally temporarily knocks out the Great Clock's power, and he wakes Clank up, and then we get this excellent starting chase level, a run through this mysterious Great Clock that teases Clank's new time-based gameplay. In some rooms, time will slow to a crawl, freezing enemies in place, slowing down the bullets that are zipping towards our hero. In others, time is stuck in a loop, reversing and replaying over and over and over again, allowing you to jump across platforms made up of the frozen rubble of a destroyed machine. And this chase culminates with a face-to-face -face between Clank and Nefarious, with the Doctor calling the Great Clock Clank's home before temporarily stunning him and then leaving Clank instead of capturing him once again. Now, I have a better idea. But, sir... Patience, Lawrence! We have all the time in the universe. It's a rare moment in this game where Nefarious shows his most menacing trait from Ratchet 3, his ability to be one step ahead of the heroes. And just like that, we bounce to the other side of the Brigus system and into the shoes of Ratchet, who's just beginning his journey. With Captain Quark, for better or worse, joining him on his quest to save Clank, Ratchet's ship Aphelion is hit by the very same time anomaly caused by Nefarious' assault on the Great Clock. Luckily, just before they fall to their deaths, the ship is frozen in one of those time anomalies. So much for clean underwear. Double luckily, the planet that they've crash-landed on happens to be inhabited by the same race of Fongoids that know about the Zoni, so immediately that game-and-a-half-long goose chase to find out what Zoni are isn't getting stretched out any further. Not so luckily, the Fongoids don't believe in technology, so Ratchet and Quark are stranded without a ship, until triple luckily, the Fungoid chief leads them right to a few Zoni that happen to be here that can repair Aphelion using their... I, I don't know, time magic or whatever. One of this game's secondary features is that on top of the returning collectibles, such as Gold Bolts and the Rhino Hollow Plan parts, Ratchet is tasked with collecting the Zoni that's scattered across the galaxy during Nefarious' attack, with 40 in total. Think of them more like Mario's Power Stars rather than the usual Ratchet & Clank collectibles. At a few points throughout this game's story, you'll need a certain number to progress, but mostly you'll just be collecting them to fill that empty void in your soul. Also, Ratchet collects them in a jar. No comment.
While we're talking about new collectibles, there's one other new one that's introduced here on this first planet, one of the series' neatest ideas that just wasn't executed well in my opinion, the Constructo Weapon Mod. For a crack in time, rather than innovating another set of new versions of the classic pistol, bomb glove, and shotgun weapons, Insomniac took a really cool idea from Quest for Booty's blueprint and hid 27 mod upgrades all throughout the game, allowing you, the player, to customize your own ideal version of these standard weapon tropes. You can set your bomb glove to have the little bouncer mini-bomb effect, a napalm effect, or it can shoot a blast into the sky to affect airborne enemies. You can change the range and spread of the shotgun's pellets or add an electric stun effect. If you want to change the pistol's trigger to charge a heavier shot that explodes on contact, or fire rapid full-auto lasers that bounce between weapons, you can do that too. You can even customize the weapon's colors to your liking. In concept, this is all awesome, but in practice, it's not the most elegant solution. For one, by the time you have even a handful of these upgrades for any one of these weapons, you'll very likely already have used that weapon enough to evolve it to its max level, and thus, it's already out of your regular weapon rotation. The series had trained players well before this point that using a maxed out weapon was a waste of perfectly good experience and should only be saved for emergencies when you're in a pinch. In this playthrough, for example, I maxed out my Constructo Pistol shortly after the third planet, by which point I could only possibly have obtained a third of the Pistol's nine mods. It takes away a significant amount of the concept's range until you can purchase the Omega upgrades in Challenge Mode and start leveling up the guns again, but even then, this idea of versatility is pretty limited since you cannot save mod presets. You have to pause the game and manually swap out your mods for each of the three slots for each weapon every time you want to change that weapon's effect. Considering that a lot of this game's arsenal is very situational, this ends up meaning that you're likely not going to change your weapon mods out all that much once you find the situational setups that cover the most bases for each Constructo weapon. This isn't the only problem related to weapon balance in this game either, it's just the most immediate one. The Constructo concept never returned after a crack in time, so it's clear that it was a fun idea that was experimented with for a bit and then dropped once the folks at Insomniac realized it wasn't the most viable concept. One excellent weapon-related idea that has returned though, and this is a necessary one given how Ratchet's level design and weapon design has changed over the years, is the Weapon Shop cutscene, this quick and funny commercial reel for each weapon that explains exactly what that weapon does. Where in the first couple games, a single weapon was made available at a time, with that level afterwards often having situations that taught you when to best use those guns, almost like a puzzle, as the games leaned further and further into pure action territory, they started giving you a larger arsenal in a short span, even making multiple weapons available for purchase within a single level. The first future game especially gave you way too many weapons at once with not nearly as many teaching moments for each, and for the super situational or more out there weapons, it could likely lead to many players just leaving those weapons behind. A Crack in Time has a greater number of those situational and experimental weapons than probably ever before. Obviously, stuff like the returning Negotiator Rocket Launcher, or Mr. Zircon, or the Groovatron are pretty self-evident, but a gun like the new Sonic Eruptor, the second weapon that you can purchase here in this first level, is exactly the kind of gun that folks might buy, use once, not understand, and put away for a while. The commercial, though, explains it in a moment. It's a shotgun that's actually just a weaponized animal attached to a trigger, don't tell PETA. Whenever you pull the trigger, it burps out its mating call, and if you wait until the creature is fully inhaled, that burp will be much more powerful. It's one of my favorite weapons in this game because it's so unique. It forces you to keep paying attention rather than just blindly pulling the trigger. I'm so glad these commercials were introduced, because they definitely allow the team to stretch its weapon ideas to even greater heights. That said, it's a travesty that the idea of the shotgun nunchuck didn't make the cut. I will say that the Sonic Eruptor to Insomniac's credit does get a lot of that training time in the early Ratchet 1 and 2 style, right after Ratchet obtains the Zony Jar, as Ratchet defends the village from an assault by Nefarious' troops. It's here that we first meet the game's most recurring secondary villain, Lord Vorsalon. You ready to let those stallions out of the stable? I was born ready. <laughs> Believe that the Nefarious was clear as to the repercussions of leaving your hovel. The clock is ours. Whoa, uh, wait. Who? 
I'm gonna give Vorsalon the benefit of the doubt for confusing two very different looking Lombaxes and blame it on a lack of depth perception on his part and the Lombaxes being essentially extinct. With Captain Quark and half of the village imprisoned inside Vorsalon's carrier, and after the Zoni used their magic to repair Ratchet's ship, it's time for a thrilling space battle slash rescue mission to close out Ratchet's first act in a crack in time. Oh. Yeah, so this is almost definitely for the best given the game's development schedule and just for most players' stomachs, but a crack in time's open-world space gameplay exists along a two-dimensional plane, making for some… incredibly anticlimactic boss encounters. If you wanted to leave Quark hanging for a bit, you could explore this sector of the galaxy and check out the moons, collect some more gold bolts, zoni, and constructo mods, and even complete a couple of this game's side quests, all while listening to your pick of four different galactic radio stations. This sort of stuff, again, is exactly what a lot of fans have been asking for. The radio, although it was a last-minute inclusion, adds a ton of fun lore snippets by way of newscasts, commercials, or DJ banter. Captain Slag and Rusty Pete, for example, founded a space pirate radio station, and their banter is much more enjoyable at a distance. Quirk's got a couple commercials on the air for his new awful hygiene product of the month and for his new movie, and we even get a couple callbacks to the PS2 games, the same sort of references that TJ Fixman excitedly talked about including during the Tools of Destruction marketing push, stuff like a commercial for Big Al's new and improved RoboShack, or the now infamous explanation for what I'm gonna call the Lombax incident. Hold on to that one. The problem is, I struggle to call most of this game's space content very uh, fun. It's a good distraction at points, for example, it's perfect here in Act 1 when you're a wide-eyed player exploring all of this for the first time, or for the first time in a while. I mean, they brought back the moons, that stuff was incredible back on the PS2. We've got actual side quests now that reward you with awesome new gadgets and abilities, and what, what do you mean all they give you is money? The dogfighting in space is… it, it well, it's, it's there, but all of this, short production or not, is half-baked. I'm more than confident that if this game had all the time and development that it should have from the start, these would be incredible additions, but I've already explained all of those development issues and it's time to stop hiding behind that excuse. The game's 30 or so moons are all about the same size and are very much so scaled back compared to Ratchet 2 and 3, naturally, and they all fit into a couple basic gimmicks and themes. There are platforming challenges on moons where the floor is lava, or liquid nitrogen or quicksand, there are a few puzzle moons that use this game's gadgets, and there are combat moons that challenge you with killing every enemy on the moon's surface. All of these moons will only reward you with one gold bolt zoni or constructo part each, with a small handful having a secret second gold bolt or something else hidden on it. Again, if you're the kind of player that only goes through these games once at most, and keep in mind that the overwhelming majority of players never even finish the games they play, so that is most people, you would never think twice about the moons. They take a couple minutes tops, so they're not offensive, they're just short enough to kill some time, but they're just not that satisfying to complete. The platforming challenge moons don't end up getting challenging until the last few at the very end of the game. The puzzle moons are as basic as they come, and aesthetically, none of these ever change up or evolve past this very basic first form. The platforming takes place on basic floating platforms, and pretty much never things that are actually built onto the moon, so the surface is just exclusively a basic sphere. Because they're everywhere, they sort of take away from the satisfaction of finding a hidden gold bolt since most of them are just a basic reward now. The ones on actual planets are still mostly cool little challenges or secrets that you'd find when revisiting, as are the Zoni, the usual Ratchet and Clank stuff you'd expect from a collectible, but they've been diluted and they feel a little bit less satisfying to collect, knowing that you can just go to a moon and get one in 30 seconds. Genuinely, the most fun that I have on these moons ever throughout this game is when I try to glide over the intended platforming route and break the game a bit, or when I finish a platforming moon and I try to glide all the way across the moon back to the ship. Teleporters are for bitches. I'll come back to this side content later as more of it unveils itself, because so long as the main gameplay is fun and engaging, who cares if the secondary stuff is weak, right? And the Vorsalon Prison Break is a really solid way to kick Ratchet's gameplay into second gear after a steady opening, even if the space combat part feels a lot less heavy-hitting than I think they wanted it to. 
Nefarious's robot troopers sneak in some really great lines. We've got some fun gravity boot sections, strong combat setups, the first of three progressively more challenging fights against Vorsalon, and at the very end we find out the location of this mysterious Lombax, Alistair Azimuth. It's all an excellent starting package for Ratchet, tightly knit into just under one hour, or just over an hour if you do all of that side stuff, which, up until this point, you would still think is also a setup for greater things to come, if I didn't just spoil that it's actually not. I remember being so excited for what was in store, excited for the next levels ahead to expand on the potential for these time anomalies, for this new Lombax character, for what that meant for Ratchet's quest to find his family. However, a crack in time never leaves second gear. It stops, and it starts, and it stops, and it starts, and it stops, and it starts, and it stops, always promising you with that next big leap forward, but pulling away right before you can take it, which brings us back to Clank. A Crack in Time's dual narrative approach jumps back and forth between short acts as each character. You'll get through Ratchet's first act in about an hour, and then be treated to 20 to 30 minutes of Clank's first act. And then it's back to Ratchet for another hour, followed by another about 30 minutes of Clank. If you add up just the first two acts of this game alone, it means that this game has more Clank gameplay than ever before. And before you groan at the thought of up to two hours of Clank gameplay, it's good. It's the best it's ever been. It's something I would have liked to see more of. That's how good it is. See, after Nefarious's attack, Clank is repaired by Sigmund, the junior caretaker of the Great Clock, and Clank's brother, kind of. We quickly learn that Clank wasn't just a defect warbot created by mistake back in Ratchet 1, he was created intentionally by Orvis, the leader of the Zoni and the designer of the Great Clock. Orvis, voiced by Mario himself, no the other one, designed Clank knowing that one day his son would discover his destiny and take over as the Keeper of the Clock, using his own powers of time manipulation that sat latent in Clank's zony soul, inside his robot body until now. Which, if you're keeping score, means that both Ratchet and Clank are chosen ones. Ratchet was sent away by his dying species, Superman-style, the last of his race destined to eventually, maybe, discover the secret of the Lombax's disappearance, destined to end the Great War against the Kragmites by fighting the last of that species, and Clank is the son of an otherworldly time god. I, I've, I've got some thoughts, but let's not ruin it all yet. I'd rather talk about how fun Clank is to play in this game. Each of Clank's acts here serves as a training course, a primer for his newfound duties as the senior caretaker of the Great Clock, and he's got a lot to learn. Much of your time as Clank will take place in these genuinely amazing time-based puzzles, wherein you record yourself performing an action and then cooperate with your past selves in real time to hit switches, reach high platforms, and open doors. Aside from the first couple tutorials, every single one of these puzzles is filled with these brilliant Eureka moments where you have to work with your past and future selves cohesively. If you hit a switch to raise a platform too quickly, for example, later when you're recording another version of yourself, you might not be able to reach that platform in time before your past self hits the switch. And on top of Clank's ability to record his past selves, he can also slow down the flow of time by throwing out a literal time bomb. With these time bombs, Clank can cross spinning gears that would otherwise fling him off and into the abyss. He can slow down enemies to give himself time to react, and even the bolts that you get from smashing crates will slow down when they enter this time bubble. It's incredible. And you can only throw one of these time bubbles out at once across all of your past and future selves, so that's another thing you have to keep track of. This entire gimmick is one of my favorite puzzle ideas in any video game ever, especially as you near the end of the game or in some of the secret bonus challenges when you have to record yourself doing an action on one time pad, then record yourself responding to that action on another time pad, and then you have to go back to the first time pad to retrace your steps and use your second self's help to progress even further. To fill some time in between these puzzle segments are some basic breathers so that you don't get frustrated if you just got over a puzzle that had you stuck for a while. Stuff like normal platforming and maybe a bit of combat, which further highlight Clank's awesome new abilities and maybe more importantly highlight the magnificence of the Great Clock itself, maybe the most beautiful Ratchet level ever. 
Between all the parts and the gears moving and ticking around you, one of the only good background songs in this entire game, Fight Me, a song that harkens back to the catchier PS2 vibes rather than this game's emphasis on strings, horns, and a more cinematic energy. The great back and forth between Clank and Sigmund, bolstered by one of Nolan North's greatest sleeper hit performances as Sigmund, this entire area is just stunning, the kind of backdrop that you wouldn't think would be possible on the PlayStation 3, let alone only three years into the system's life in a game that was made in 10 months. But my favorite part about The Great Clock is one of the better subversions in Ratchet's entire history. It's a level that starts broken that you have to fix. That's because Clank also gets his own analog to Ratchet's wrench, but unlike the wrench, you don't necessarily use it mostly to smash. This Chrono Scepter also affects the flow of time, allowing you to hit projectiles and reverse them back at your enemies. If you hit the shattered pieces of the Great Clock's terrain, you'll get to watch as they unshatter in real time, and they even give you bolts just like whenever you smashed a light back as Ratchet. This further proves my point, by the way, that, say it with me, Clank is always right. <sighs> Still didn't say it with me. However, for as much as I love these Clank sections, they run into the exact same problem that Ratchets do, in that the acts themselves are a bit too formulaic, and it takes so long for you to fully get into gear that by the time you've hit a groove, the section or the game is almost over. All of Clank's acts follow a very similar, very repetitive structure. You walk through a part of the clock, solve one or two time puzzles, enter one of these mnemonic stations to go into Clank's psyche for a bit and talk to an AI recreation of his dad Orvis, do a few more time puzzles, and by that point, you're done. Now forgive me if I jump ahead a bit here, I'm not really going to cover Clank's stuff chronologically because there's really only one more thing to say about him. In Clank's second act, he learns how to reverse the time anomalies caused by the Great Clock being partially broken by Nefarious. To do this, you play a weird shoot 'em up minigame using the Chrono Scepter to blast the anomalies as they appear. It's a cute idea that gets used only in this second act, that makes up most of this second act, never to be used again aside from two secret bonus rooms, one hidden in Act 3 and one that requires you to backtrack into the intro area. As simple as the idea is, it's one that I wish was either used more fully or called out more directly, because the game never spells it out, but these planets that Clank's fixing are the very same ones that Ratchet visits right before this act of the game. When you're playing that first act as Ratchet, there are a few areas that end up walled off by the time anomalies you've encountered, and if you go back and revisit those planets after you take control of Ratchet again after Clank's second act, usually you'll find a gold bolt or some other secret that you couldn't access until Clank restored the proper flow of time on that planet. On one hand, I adore that this is a great piece of subtext, but on the other, this could have been a great way to incorporate time more directly into the main parts of Ratchet gameplay. Once you get past the first level as Ratchet, the whole time gimmick is an afterthought for his side of the game for the next four to six plus hours, depending on how much or how little side content you decide to do. Now, sure, Clank's gameplay is all time-driven, but by the time you really start getting into any of Clank's chapters, just like that, it's over, and you start Ratchet's next chapter, which usually has a slow opening to ease you back in. And then, right when you're really getting into Ratchet's side of the gameplay and they've ramped up the tension, it's been about another hour. Your timer's up, boom, go walk around slowly as Clank for a while. Since Clank's sections are usually 5 to 10 minutes of warm-up or outright tutorial, 5 to 10 more minutes of letting you get into a groove, and then a boss fight or a cutscene, you never get to stay interested for long. It's a disservice to how fun his puzzles are that they make up so little of his part of the game. To jump ahead a little bit further, Ratchet's third act is the only one that's longer than two levels and about an hour, in that it's two levels, an arena, and also you go into Vorsalon's area again, which is pretty much the same as the time before, with a couple extra puzzles in there. Clank never gets more than 30 minutes at a time, and even the concluding act when Ratchet and Clank are finally reunited, it's only about two hours, three if you're not so tired of the boring side quests and moons by that point that you want to do the last handful left and get the rest of the Rhino parts. Those last few moons even feel at odds with the plot's pacing, because by then you're going to be so eager to see how the game ends that you're not going to want to do the side content, and all of this is not to mention that the game cut out any puzzles or viable areas to use Clank's time bomb ability now that he's on Ratchet's back. 
And since Ratchet can now glide on his own thanks to his hover boots, at that point, after all of this character development throughout the game, at that point, after becoming a time god himself, Clank's relegated to being a backpack once again as far as gameplay is concerned. The game tries so hard to design around this back and forth in such a way that each section usually ends with a big moment, an awesome boss fight, a big story revelation, something to compensate for this constant shifting, to leave you dying to see what's next. And while those moments are usually good, not necessarily great, it's disjointed enough to pull me right out of my flow state every single time. And this disconnect carries through another huge gap in a crack in time for me, which is, although they're the protagonists, this story isn't really about Ratchet or Clank. They end up being active participants in somebody else's story as often as they control their own journeys. Like with Clank, for most of the game, he's just accepted, oh yeah, I'm a god now, whatever, he doesn't think to send Ratchet a DM or anything, and I find myself enjoying Sigmund's conversation more. His heartbroken utterance of, Please don't go. End recording. It's dangerous. When he replays the message that Orvis left him right before disappearing is one of the most somber lines in the entirety of Ratchet and Clank. His dad left him two years ago to go meet with some doctor or get milk or something, and presumably, every single day since, Sigmund's replayed this message to cope with being left all alone, responsible for protecting time itself, knowing that he's not even the one that his dad trusted with that task. If you thought that Atlas had a burden holding up just one planet, imagine holding together existence. Likewise, once you really dig into it, Ratchet's story isn't really all that much about Ratchet as it is his newly met sort of family member, his analog to Sigmund, the equally burdened General Alistair Azimuth. When Ratchet's second act of the game begins, to a large extent, his story starts to drop its focus as his goals begin to overlap with Alistair's. For one, for the second planet in a row, Ratchet's introduced to an incredibly low-stakes fetch mission before he can actually get to his main objective, in this case making his way to this rumored other Lombax. Where initially he was saving a few Fongoid children, something that, at the very least, is a noble cause, here Ratchet helps this species of junk hoarders reactivate their community's power by reconnecting its batteries. Except they're not exactly batteries as much as slaves? For some reason, in this universe, they couldn't just make batteries. These are sentient battery robots that scream in pain when connected back to their circuit, creatures that are in such pain that they actively rise up and, pardon the pun, Revolt. <laughs> Ratchet just smiles and nods as he throws them back into their hellish torture. Poor little guys. It's the sort of padding mission that works as a bit of world building that would introduce us to a proper community, something that fans like myself were looking for, but something that works a lot better in a game that doesn't stop and start so much, in a game that has a bit more time, both in the pipeline and story length, so that this sort of lower key village area feels more important than... I don't know, just being a whole level that doesn't really have much to it? This planet has no side quests. You can't talk to any of these people after this mission's over. It just sort of exists. And I don't want to make this a PS2 versus PS3 thing, because enough people argue about that all the time, and frankly, I don't really care since both sagas have a lot of great strengths over one another. But this winding journey with smaller stakes missions worked significantly better in the PS2 saga when the story wasn't trying to take itself as seriously. Here, though, when you aim for a higher standard, you've got to be held to that higher standard. It's no more than a minute or two later that Ratchet finds Azimuth and pursues the fleeing general in a short but thrilling grind rail chase, with the older Lombax believing Ratchet to be an assassin in disguise, until he gets a close-up look at him. Now I've got you! It can't be. You're... you're Caden's son. The exile that he is, we don't exactly get a lot from Azimuth right away, as he bottles up those failures and those traumas from what he experienced 20 plus years in the past. A bit later in the story, after a ton of Azimuth redirecting the conversation whenever Ratchet tries to get any answers whatsoever, the wall finally comes down, with all the subtlety of a Kragmite in a china shop. The General informs us that he's the one responsible for the events leading to this entire saga by giving Tachyon access to all of the Lombax technology against the insistence of Ratchet's father that this would be a huge mistake. 
Now, the backstory is kind of rewritten a bit from the first Future game, since before we had heard that Tachyon was found as an egg and the Lombaxes raised him out of a collective guilt. Here, Azimuth instead says that an already grown-up Tachyon approached the Lombax leaders. Really, it doesn't matter. Technically, those two different pieces of lore can be reconciled if you do the writing work yourself, but I know that if I don't mention it, somebody else will say that I forgot or that I missed it. I did not. Whatever the actual version of events is, is irrelevant. The end result here is that Tachyon, as we know, used that Lombax tech against them, forcing the Lombaxes to escape to another dimension and leaving Tachyon as the new self-proclaimed emperor of the Polaris galaxy. The only Lombaxes that were left behind were Ratchet's father, who swore revenge after Tachyon killed Ratchet's mom, the infant Ratchet himself who was sent away to safety by his father before the latter was killed by Tachyon, and... Azimuth, because, as a punishment for his failure, he was forced by the other Lombaxes to stay behind in exile. Just those three Lombaxes. No, nobody else. Shut up. Just like with Sigmund, it's this failure, the disappearance of his loved ones, and his inability to stop or prevent it that haunts Alistair every waking moment of every single day. Every restless night full of dreams that won't stop replaying. Both of them just want to go back and make it right. It's just that one of those two knows that that's impossible, and the other, they can't accept that yet. But coming back to just this point in the story, since we already learned a decent amount about the Great Clock from that first chapter as Clank, Alistair is mainly repeating some of that information to Ratchet, who obviously wouldn't know any of this. He's briefly talking about his friendship with Ratchet's father, and he's setting up the inevitable conflict. We as players already know that the clock isn't meant to alter the flow of time, only keep that flow stable, but Azimuth... That's a different story, and that truth runs directly opposed to the fantasy that he's been playing in his head every day for decades, a fantasy where he reverses the flow of time and undoes the Lombax race's exodus from this dimension. Sometimes the universe has a cruel sense of humor. Even thinking back to his failures is so difficult for Azimuth that he redirects the conversation onto his own terms whenever the opportunity strikes. There's one part of this cutscene that I want to highlight, both because it's a masterstroke from the animation team and because it's related to what I feel is a significant narrative shortcoming with a crack in time. Right here, as Azimuth is talking about the clock, the stuff that we've already heard about with Clank, we're trained to follow Ratchet's eyes as he scouts Azimuth's wall of great clock theories, blueprints, sticky notes, this cluttered mess accompanying what might just be the ramblings of a madman. And as we're following his eyes, we cut to a shot of Ratchet's pensive, almost concerned glare. His furrowed brow and almost lowered ears tell us that Ratchet's got some level of doubt in Azimuth right from the jump. But the game struggles to deliver that conflict after this because, and this is one of the things that bothers me most with A Crack in Time, we rarely hear from Ratchet directly during the levels that involve Azimuth, and I truly think that this is where the game's, well, I don't want to call it a death by a thousand cuts, but this is where those cuts sting the most. During cutscenes, Ratchet's usually just about his normal self, although again, dialed into a bit more of a serious demeanor just like with the rest of the future saga. Well, unless Quirk is involved, then all bets are off and Ratchet's in prime form. He does not understand that being a hero is 45% strength, 60% bravery, and 10% raw intelligence. That's 115%! You're welcome. Outside of cutscenes, however, the dude's, more often than not, a plank of wood. There are a select few lines of mid-gameplay banter that involve Ratchet at very specific points. Sure, we never would have gotten the reward over consequence conversation without that, but even then, much of that is often Azimuth expositing at Ratchet, with our main character just sitting there, silent outside of cutscenes and right when he lands his ship. A good rule of thumb is that if it's an area where a crack in time doesn't include subtitles, i.e. gameplay for some reason, Ratchet's just not talking much. Instead, the game tends to assume that you'll cover the gaps for it. After some training with Ratchet's new hover boots, he and Azimuth try and find a way to make contact with Clank by breaking and entering into a massive nefarious-affiliated tech corporation and stealing their intel. At several points during this mission, Azimuth's battle chat includes lines like, Ready for some combat? He'll call dibs on enemies. Azimuth's nerdy ally inside the company at one point asks Ratchet if he's ready for a solo mission, the sort of stuff that inside your head you're responding to. Of course Ratchet can go solo. He liberated this galaxy a couple years ago. He seemingly wiped out all known space pirate activity. He's already the most accredited hero in the history of the Polaris galaxy, and that's all stuff he wasn't even trying to do. But 
that's me saying that, not Ratchet. It's such an odd disparity where he just doesn't feel very connected to the events occurring around him outside of those cutscenes, which is specifically more noticeable this time around because of this game's attempt at digging super deep into a personal story. Now, I wouldn't be at all surprised if there was some sort of technical issue behind the scenes where they just didn't have good places to trigger Ratchet's lines to pop up since his levels are far more open than Clank's. After all, they nail that balancing act with Clank's dialogue, and most of Ratchet's chatter comes in his most linear sections of gameplay. Perhaps without solid places to anchor Ratchet's voice clips, he may have ended up repeating himself, or talking too much, or his lines may just have never triggered at all. Many developers will tell you that balancing voiceover is often a dedicated job all its own, and as later games showed, it's more than possible to lean too much into the talkative direction. It's noteworthy, though, that I never found myself questioning these sorts of things or noticing Ratchet's mid-game silence much at all in the earlier titles, because those games weren't aiming for this higher bar of storytelling, not even Future 1, I would argue. It's, again, because this game tries to push itself so far and away above what the prior Ratchets could achieve that it's more dissonant, more of an almost uncanny valley, every single time that it falls short. Knowing Ratchet, you would expect at some point that he would have to butt heads with Azimuth harder than he does. We saw that he's uncertain about him, but it takes a while and a bunch of cutscenes for that to ever break through, and even then, it's kind of minimal. Up until then, we have Azimuth sort of big-brothering over Ratchet, taking him under his wing and training him for this fight against Nefarious, which kind of feels condescending considering that Ratchet whooped his ass years ago, and yet that's not really ever brought up between the two. We have three of the four enemy groups focusing more on their nebulous history fighting Azimuth over the last couple years, and really, none of the villains take Ratchet seriously by comparison until over halfway into the game. Like, just give me one crumb here. Have Ratchet tell Azimuth that Tachyon, Tachyon, which one was? Oh, the diaper kid. Yeah, I beat that guy. And let me reiterate, I hate feeling this way, because Azimuth at a macro level is so well-performed, he's such a compelling, tragic character, one of the best in Ratchet & Clank, but it's clear that his story, just like everybody else's, was jerked around, left with some gaps during production, and had to be square-pegged to fill this game's round holes. There's no doubt to me that there were entire levels lopped off of this game's structure at some point. Why else would one quarter of a Kraken Time's weapons be locked behind the arena battles? Those planets probably would have had some very important story beats that ended up lumped together or dropped entirely, and all of these cuts are likely why a character such as Vorsalon was even conceptualized, so that a level could be reused once or twice to pad out the game length and give Alistair Azimuth a convenient reason to dip out for a bit and go fight one of his many, many foes, so that Captain Quark can then sub in every now and then and get some of the very limited hero spotlight. Now that I think about it, we never see Azimuth and Captain Quark in the same place at the same time. Suspicious. All jokes aside, it makes complete sense that Talwin got the short end of the stick, because this game cannot juggle all the balls that it tries to introduce, let alone bring back all the other stuff from the game before it, despite a lot of that stuff that was cut being the original point of the entire saga. There is simply too much going on for a game packed into such a short runtime and an even shorter development pipeline. And yet, for some reason, you might recall that I said there were four different villains packed throughout a crack in time. Yeah, so what this means is more or less Nefarious does pretty much nothing. His whole MO throughout the entire story is to wait around and be comic relief during the interludes between Ratchet and Clank's chapters, waiting for Clank to unlock the Orvis Chamber and lead Nefarious' butler Lawrence right to it since they placed a tracker on Clank. Instead, what Ratchet and Azimuth do throughout the story is deal with Nefarious' many goons, between the mercenary Vorsalon, who's almost immediately followed up by the Valkyries, an entire race of... Helgas, that Nefarious bribes by promising to unsupernova their home planet, and also one of them is Nefarious' love interest for whatever reason. I guess both Quark and Nefarious have the same type. Despite being introduced pretty early into the game's story, however, the Valkyries only fight Ratchet in two specific situations, one of them being two of these incredibly weak space battles for which the Valkyrie ships were a hot swap after the planned space bosses ended up not being fun, and the other one is a massive battle throughout a floating city during which the Valkyries are almost entirely wiped out. Well, except for Helga and this lady who's e-dating some nerd. My weapons are still armed. I can make it look like an accident. That's okay, Aphelion. Let's go. 
Since every other enemy race is used at least three full times, I have to think the Valkyries were meant to be much more heavily featured in this game's very rushed final act, in those levels that were likely lopped off at the end of this game's essentially non-existent pre-production. If you're keeping track, that makes three different loosely related villains that pop in and out of this game's story as much as they're needed, but I mentioned a fourth, so what about them? Well, that'd be the Argorians, who Ratchet and Azimuth first encounter after their heart-to-heart -heart in that random dark cave. Why do we fight them? Because, well, do you remember that whole and suddenly pirate story that I told back in Tools of Destruction? Yeah. Yep. Suddenly, Argorians. This species of meat-headed lizardmen was part of a cartoonish universe-building initiative for a crack in time, wherein the team designed and implemented a number of different species that all had, well, exactly one character trait. The Volards are hoarders, the Fongoids have a speech impediment because they time-traveled too much or something, these Terachnoids we encountered earlier in the game are just nerds, and the Argorians represent high school jocks. Honestly, I kind of dig this. See, the target audience for Ratchet 1, despite the original T rating, was 7 to 10 year old boys, so by the time that A Crack in Time would be out, those kids growing up with the franchise would be dealing with the same sort of high school social dynamics. It checks out, and the characters' lines are usually really funny. It all… it all works. I more draw issue with the Argorians suddenly showing up for this big spectacle battle that's pointed to as the showcase level for this game. This level, the Battle of Krell Canyon, is the one featured in a Kraken Times demo, and it, along with the other Argorian level, they're just bland battlefields with hordes of enemies and they're not really all that fun. And this is really what it can come down to for me. I know throughout a lot of this retrospective, some of you may not have gone back to that timestamp that I told you to save earlier. It makes the game we did end up getting all the more impressive. And I know that some folks will be thinking, well, it's still Ratchet. The story can miss a bit so long as the gameplay hits. That's what matters. And I agree, but that's the thing. This is probably totally a me thing. I'm likely the odd man out with this. It doesn't. The gameplay just doesn't hit. Some parts are totally fine in a vacuum, all the stuff you'd expect from Ratchet. The weapons are mostly solid, visually the planets are usually pretty beautiful, and the way that the allies join you on these battles feels far more substantial than the first future game could ever dream of. Sorry, Kronk. But at the same time, the actual level design is lacking, and none of it comes together in a way that I've ever found all that satisfying. So many times, the game just defaults to one wide open area where it just throws arrays of the same six or so nefarious troopers at you, with more and more and more UFOs flying in to spawn more enemies in the exact same spots. That's... That's it. That'll be the meat and potatoes of the level. One big area that's often designed to be a normal, flat, mundane village or something, rather than a fun jungle gym that you explore throughout. Some of these levels may have a short hallway, a linear section before or after with some basic platforming or some hover boot stuff, or a simple puzzle that requires you to use Ratchet's only new gadget, but it's nowhere near as cleverly designed as in the earlier Ratchet and Clanks. At least in previous games, you'd run through multiple shorter fights while progressing through smaller areas, and the actual basic act of moving through a level rather than circling inside a big field made your progress feel more earned. These may as well be Deadlocked-styled gauntlets at times, except the original, intended version of Deadlocked that we never got, where they would just throw you into the overworld rather than segmenting those levels into missions and say, hey, have fun, and instead of the play-by-play -play announcers chiming in with funny quips, here you end up with Alistair telling you that Ratchet's father would be proud of him over and over and over again. To its credit, the enemy AI and pathfinding has been overhauled from previous games to fit more properly into these big battlefields, the thing that they couldn't figure out how to accomplish on PS2 hardware back with Deadlocked. And this was much needed given that there are many more defined classes of enemies that approach you differently, and on that front, I have no real criticisms. On the harder difficulties, you can find yourself overwhelmed pretty quickly with close quarters baddies chasing you down, with bombers lobbing grenades at you, Gatling guns peppering in your direction, and if you're fighting the Argorians like you are here in the Battle of Krell Canyon, you'd better be ready to deal with some shielded enemies. These guys are probably my favorite use of Ratchet's Wrench Tether in this entire game, because they force you to completely change up your battle plan the moment they appear. 
There's some dumb button that gets pressed deep in my mind when I'm given this sort of combat challenge. Do I stop everything and pull this guy's shield off so he doesn't swarm me later but risk taking damage in the process? Do I take out other enemies first to avoid risking damage and then deal with him at the end? Do I just fire a dynamo of doom shot and let it pass through him, zapping him from behind and killing him without worrying about the shield? Yeah, actually, you know what? Okay, that's probably the answer most of the time in a pinch, but still, the next step in ratchet enemy design this entire time should have been enemies that aren't just bullet sponges, enemies that demanded more thought and required you to tackle them in a specific order or focus, and it should have been around years before this, and I don't like being so critical for such an extended time, so let me have this one win. But as much as I love some of this wrench tether integration into, actually, now that I think about it, pretty much only the Argorian fights, that kinda sucks, w w whatever, as much as I should love the idea of this sort of objective-based battle where you have to hunt down and defeat the captains first, and then two Hydra tank bosses, all while dealing with enemies still swarming you, as much as the scope of this battle was exactly the thing that I wanted after I first played Ratchet 3 or Deadlocked, here, the charm, the appeal, it never hit me because this level, this battle, doesn't really feel earned. I know I said earlier that the collectibles at the very least that were on the planets were usually okay, but really, outside of the game's, like, I don't know, two more linear levels, the secrets in these open levels are almost always as clear as day right in front of you. The zoni are frequently used as a player guide, as a way of telling you, this is the way you need to go, my child. An obvious trail of floating bolts usually leads you right to a secret, more often than ever before, and all the zoni do is give you a bit of experience towards your next health upgrade, and add other, mostly useless upgrades to your ship to make that empty side feature feel less barren while you're shooting at nothing in space. Except you need a certain number of zoni to be allowed into some of the levels. Your ship isn't fast enough to get past one planet's satellite array without the amazingly named Thrustmaster 500 boost upgrade. Better go do some boring moons. This game, at times, feels like a mediocre collectathon that thinks it's Mario 64, but is much closer to ukulele. Anyway, as far as the main objective goes here on Krell Canyon, you just sort of go around and do things. Azimuth goes around and does his own thing. There's a turret section, because this was a PS3 game, they all needed the obligatory bad turret section. It doesn't really feel satisfying, not nearly as much as the game thinks it will. It's more sizzle than it is steak, and that's like a lot of this game. It's a game that wants to go out and feel larger than life, that wants to almost Oscar bait your praise, but they didn't have the time to actually make it larger than life and earn that praise to me. We don't get an incredible landing vista on Krell Canyon, one of the required hallmarks that Insomniac internally focuses on with every single level in every single Ratchet & Clank game. We land in a cave, which is unique, sure, credit there. The hover boots, which were intended to give Ratchet the ability to glide as a substitute for Clank for most of this game, end up replacing a lot of the fun platforming moments and setups, instead giving you some fast-paced Sonic-esque boost pads and bounce pads that the frame rate just can't handle well. All they served to do in reality was make a lot of these levels bigger, but not better, just emptier. Hell, for the most part, a lot of this game's platforming is sequestered off onto the moons, and again, those are so cookie-cutter, so the planets that were designed as these heavy action set pieces actually don't tend to have many action set pieces. This level is absolutely a fitting microcosm of the game, but that's not a compliment. For years now, I was sure that I was on an island all my own with this game, because I couldn't see which part of this highly praised gameplay was actually deserving of that praise. Hell, I thought I was insane for noticing that this game can't even hold a steady 60 frames per second, despite everybody thinking that this was the final 60 FPS Ratchet game until recently. No, this game is the reason that future Ratchet games drop down to 30, because 60 just wasn't sustainable in Insomniac's eyes, in a world where their own research showed that sales, public opinion, and review scores were more hurt by a less visually stimulating game than those games benefited from having a higher refresh rate. Only that loud fraction of gaming audiences cared that much about 30 versus 60 frames per second, and most players either can't tell the difference or prefer a game that would put that horsepower into pure visual spectacle. A crack in time tried its hardest to go for both high visual fidelity and a 60 FPS cap at once, and when you're standing still or walking, it holds 60, sure, but in combat? Oh god no, absolutely not. 
I ran a few different clips through some frame rate analysis software, and in Krell Canyon here, the game averaged 43.9 frames per second, hovering around 50 when I hover booted through the map, and consistently staying in the low 40s or below when in combat, even dropping as low as 29. As you can see, it's not even close to a stable frame rate, but I think because so many contemporaries could barely maintain at 30 FPS, so many fans hyped it up a bit. Total aside, by the way, it says a lot about how much frame rate actually matters to the most hardcore gaming audiences that those hardcore fans didn't even notice that this game wasn't 60 FPS in the same breath that they were talking down the later games for locking at 30. And for the record, if you want to blame hardware or anything, you can't because I transferred this save and redid these tests across multiple different versions of the game, including a digital copy on two different PlayStation 3 models to account for system age. I tested it on PlayStation now streaming on my PS5, and even on my original disc, although that disc was scratched a little bit and causing issues specifically with cutscenes, so feel free to discount that from the analysis if you really want to hold onto the false notion that this game runs well. It doesn't. It doesn't run well, and that's part of what makes me feel like these battles aren't that warranted, let alone earned. When the game starts chopping around, it seems like many of the explosions and particle effects even drop dynamically in their resolution to try and save on memory and stabilize, which makes even some of the most explosive, highest action moments, the stuff that we come to Ratchet & Clank 4, feel a bit low rent. Of the levels in A Crack in Time, I think I truly enjoy… two of them? There's just some it factor that these planets have never had to me, no matter how many times I try to warm up to them, and there have been a lot of times that I've tried. Maybe the ratio of platforming to combat to puzzles is just off for me, because they're separated into these chapter-broken layers like oil on water. Which is fitting since this game's only puzzle gadget is one where you suck up oil and water, as well as nectar, and shoot them out to solve basic puzzles such as lube up that bolt crank. Maybe the wide array of situational weapons, but the dearth of situations in which to use those weapons hits me weirdly. Like, I love that the Tesla spikes exist, these laser mine tripwires that call all the way back to one of Ratchet 2's cut weapons, but when most of the game's levels are wider and a lot of the enemies don't actually chase you that far since they have, you know, weapons that work at a range, it's tough to find a use for them until it's really fully leveled up, at which point, admittedly, it wrecks everything. This game's sniper rifle is easily the coolest of its kind in the series, as when you zoom in, it'll highlight enemy weak points and do double damage if you hit those critical spots. But it's funnily enough got a pet weapon of its own just to make it more useful at closer ranges? What? That weapon? The Cryomine Glove, which the game suggests that you should use to freeze enemies in place and set them up for a cool critical hit with a sniper. But why does there need to be a separate cryomine glove that struggles to earn experience when, I don't know, there's a constructo bomb glove that could have just had a freeze mod? These things all just sort of eat at me because a crack in time is so close at times and then it just completely falls off at others. Hell, maybe part of my issue is some level of, I don't know, unconscious response to the valiant but failed effort to distract me with boring side content so that I don't notice the game tearing at the seams at every turn, or that I don't notice that it's actually a pretty short game. And I know I've already talked about the forgettable space gameplay, but I haven't even had a chance to dig fully at the actual side missions, which are all so basic that I would almost rather not have them try at all if this is what we're gonna get. Every single one of these is located in the overworld space hubs, never the villages that they put time into designing to give you an emphasis on world building, the ones that you, you know, save along the journey, and these missions are just not even decent. My favorite is one where you need to use a special ship gadget to extract a piece of ore from a moving comet. Oh, no, 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 that's not me saying that. That's a quote from this game's project manager. The best side quest in this game, according to somebody that helped lead the game's production, involves flying behind a comet, pressing the fire button for a few seconds, and then pressing square. There are some really incredible experiences to be had here. These incredible experiences came to your screens three months before Mass Effect 2. I know this sort of open-world RPG side content was all the rage, but sometimes it's okay to stick with what you know. 
Hell, maybe if they integrated side quests into the moons more than, I think, once, it would be a much different story, but they don't. If we had a crystal hunting side mission in the vein of Ratchets 2 and 3, since most of what this game does is still taken right from those two games, or maybe if instead there were a Leviathan Souls like in Tools of Destruction, it would be something that felt like productive busy work that actually leveled up your weapons rather than plowing into stuff with a ship that doesn't even count towards your health experience. But no, we couldn't get Leviathan Souls because those Leviathan enemies from Tools of Destruction were actually meant for this boring space stuff as roaming enemies, and they were cut due to a lack of time and polish as well. If you notice a trend here, most of the space stuff was cut, say it with me, due to a lack of time and polish. But remember, in total fairness, it's not like they could just cut their losses entirely. If they were even three months into production when they realized that the space stuff wasn't working, guess what? They only had about six more months until the game needed to be finished, polished, and printed on discs. Hindsight's 2020. I will never knock anybody involved in development for going ambitious and then getting tripped up in that ambition, but man, I would have much preferred if this dumb little Geometry Wars inspired space combat idea ended up being the idea they went with for Quest for Booty like was originally pitched. It would have taken a much smaller team, much less time to make that game, and it would have meant that this game would have delivered at least a bit more instead of being cut into by a game that we did not need. But then, if I could truly go back in time, I would just go back to 2006 and tell them to shut up about co-op in Ratchet & Clank so that the team wasn't in near-constant crunch mode for several straight years across two series. Moreover, if the rewards were more substantial for the side quests, like, I don't know, if they lumped some of the gold bolts, zoni, constructo mods, rhino parts, or even just other random tiny character upgrades, if they made any of these things rewards for side quests, it would be different. Again, there are a quarter of this game's weapons that are locked behind the arena, along with 15 other collectibles in that arena. 19 of the 20 arena challenges give you some sort of major collectible reward, and zero of the about 20 side quests give you anything besides a small amount of bolts that you don't even really need. Even if you don't have a Tools of Destruction save file to get the returning customer discount on some weapons, you'll still have enough bolts on a critical path run to get most everything. Maybe. Maybe you'll have to skip out on the final armor. Maybe. And let me make it clear, all of this basic side content makes up half of the intended length of this game. My first playthrough for this retrospective, where I did everything on the game's hard difficulty, left me with 500,000 spare bolts and took exactly 9 hours. Really, it was less than that, since that counts me roaming the Insomniac Museum for like an hour, and also trying to record very specific clips at different points throughout the game. A week later, when I went back through the game on a fresh file and focused just on the main story? Just under four and a half hours of gameplay, and no skipped cutscenes or anything either. Well, and you should also add another half hour to that since I went back to do all four of this game's arena cups. I always find myself doing the arena in full whenever I play a crack in time because... That's the most fun I tend to have as Ratchet in this game. Seriously, credit to them, these Battleplex missions are some of the most unique and fun challenges in any Ratchet arena ever, including missions like using your wrench to toss bombs back at enemies, a challenge that uses your Omnisoaker to kill enemies, putting down the battery bot uprising once again. Really, if the cut hoverboot racetracks were able to be polished up and make it into the game, this would be just about a perfect arena for me. It's just a stellar amount of chaos, and Steve Bloom as the announcer only helps. Ratchet comes here mainly to save Captain Quirk after he gets into trouble with the very same Argorians that we just fought a moment ago, but conveniently you also happen to pick up one of Nefarious's employees' keycards, which we happen to need for the next major level. See, after Alistair and Ratchet save the villagers in Krell Canyon, they found what they had originally come to that planet for, an Obsidian Eye, the very same device that Ratchet had used back in Quest for Booty to contact the Zoni. Finally able to make contact with Ratchet's pretty cool robot friend, the Lombaxes could at last get the coordinates to the Great Clock, for, in Ratchet's eyes, a reunion with his pal, and in Alistair's eyes, a 20-year rewind, a second chance to save the Lombaxes. Instead, Clank hits his buddy with a bombshell. Please, save my father. Father? Clank begs Ratchet to head to planet Xanafar, and has Sigmund set up a time portal back a few years to right around the time when Orbis originally went missing after his meeting with Dr. Nefarious. With any luck, Ratchet can avert this entire crisis right here and now. Or there and then. A Crack in Time gives Ratchet two time travel levels that are easily the coolest in the game conceptually, but sadly, these levels, I have to think, were, like everything else, cut back in scope. 
this time though, that wasn't due to time, but instead due to hardware. First, after using an employee access card to help free an encampment of enslaved fongoids, we finally get to a battle that I think feels pretty earned. Liberating and then fighting alongside a whole village of fongoids just kind of clicked with me, a brief moment where this game's intended scale actually played out off of the page in a fully satisfying way, no asterisks at all. It's after we finish saving the village that we finally get to play with the flow of time, jumping into this portal and instantly teleporting back a few years, with only an instant white flash covering up the game's very fast loading. And after the jump, we end up in a very different Xanathar, not long after the Fongoids had been indoctrinated and enslaved by Nefarious. The hellish tundra that we saw in the present is nowhere to be seen. Instead, this terrain is lush, it's lively, it's reminiscent of the other Fongoid world we traveled to back in level 1. To be able to go back and forth in real time and see all of the small details and differences, from the oil derrick sucking the life out of the planet in the present, the exact landing spot of Nefarious's asteroid in the past, the eerie, monotone quotes from the indoctrinated Fongoids who, thankfully, eventually came to their senses over the following years of well, sadly, probably torture, it's all mind-blowing for PS3 hardware. However, having two identical level maps loaded at the same time with players freely able to hop back and forth, that has an enormous memory cost that greatly limits how far these levels can be taken. This disappointingly means that both of the timey-wimey planets in A Crack in Time are little more than an awesome proof of concept, likely this game's biggest missed opportunity, and that says a lot after all I've said before this. Optimize all you want, even if Insomniac's Wizards had another three full years of production, they were still developing for a system that had such little accessible memory that it couldn't even handle party chat. It doesn't make all of the cool time travel stuff any less neat, but it does mean that all of that cool stuff only lasts about five minutes each and leaves you begging for more than just a sampler. Here on Xanafar, for example, we have to reach an oil derrick in the present day so that we can unrust a bolt crank in the past. To do that, we have to plant some giant vine seeds in the past, then leap through the portal and ride across the now fully grown vines in the present to reach the oil derrick platform, then grab the oil with the Omnisoaker, return to the past, lube up, and activate the bridge. After Ratchet infiltrates past Nefarious' base, he finds the doctor interrogating Clank's captured father, who, as a time god, probably should have seen this coming. Unwilling to endure any more torture or give up the location of the Great Clock, Orvis sort of just phases out of existence, but he accidentally leaves behind one imprint from his memory before he goes. Clank? Yo! Yeah, so that's the end of that level. It's a great revelatory moment for how Nefarious found out about Clank's powers, Ratchet's attack has a ripple effect cracking part of present-day Nefarious' head and further damaging the already kind of cuckoo robot doctor, but then, like Orvis, poof, it's over. If I had to guess, there was some kind of chase sequence to end this level that had to have gotten cut here, maybe the canned set piece where Ratchet was apparently going to ride a missile into Vorsalon's cruiser. I say that because while Ratchet was doing all of this, Azimuth had gone to distract Lord Vorsalon, a way of getting Alistair out of the way so that he doesn't see that abusing time travel might be bad. Alistair naturally ends up getting captured, telling Ratchet to leave him behind and focus on the clock. So Ratchet, of course, saves him, although Azimuth then gets a little bit pissy, arguably not because Ratchet diverted from the main objective or anything like that, but instead because Azimuth has been looking for a way to die honorably for years, hunting for that moment where he could say, go on without me and be a martyr. Around the same time that Ratchet's saving Azimuth, Clank is none the wiser to Nefarious' plot, and right as he and Sigmund reach the Orvis chamber, Clank is captured by Lawrence, who sets Clank's distress signal off to lure Ratchet into a trap. If you're keeping track, that means that Ratchet goes on four consecutive rescue missions for Quark, Orvis, Azimuth, and now Clank. Make that five if you count the Fongoid kids. Actually, wait, can we call it rescuing when you re-enslave those battery bots? If so, may maybe six? Also, if Clank has a distress signal that he could have set off this entire time, why didn't he just set it off the moment that he woke up and was safe in the clock? You know, to try and make contact with his best friend? How inconsiderate. The two Lombaxes rush right into that trap, but power through the Valkyrie's ambush, wiping out pretty much that entire species and leading to the long-awaited and honestly perfectly executed reuniting moment between Ratchet and Clank. <sighs> Hello, Ratchet. <sighs> hey, pal. How you doing? 
fine. You? <sighs> yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just gonna lie here for a while though, okay? Whew. I really like the idea of this Valkyrie level. I mean, hey, we finally get a linear level with a few smaller branching paths, good combat setups, a bunch of platforming, it feels like, you know, you do something, there's some fun little puzzles, it's all pretty good, but thanks to the constant pathetic death trap encounters that just trap you in a small room and then take 25 seconds, it sort of ends up feeling way too gimmicky to be the only level the Valkyries ever end up getting. Whatever the case, they're dead, who cares? I love these next few minutes of cutscenes, from Ratchet finally saving Clank from a huge fall to pay off the handful of times that Clank saved Ratchet from those falls and ironically put his buddy's safety on his own smaller back. And after this is another one of those understated moments that the game shines at when given the chance, when we actually get to see Tools of Destruction's story come back into play properly. This whole game, Ratchet's been following Alistair's plan without much dispute, chasing at the hope of reuniting with his parents, his species, with saving the Lombaxes. The whole time that he'd been searching for Clank over the past two full years, he had shelved that desire in his mind to meet his family, but in the process of finding one part of his family, now he's so close to maybe finding the other. But, and this is important, he listens to Clank's urging that it's too impossibly dangerous to play with a device like the Great Clock. He thinks back to his arguments with Clank in Tools of Destruction, both regarding the Dimensionator and even when Ratchet didn't trust Clank about the Zoni's existence. All of those little arguments that were fueled by Ratchet's blind determination to find his family, to find his purpose. Ratchet realizes it's that same determination that's been fueling Azimuth now and for the past 20 plus years, and Ratchet remembers that Clank is always right. After this entire journey, Ratchet foregoes his chance at undoing Tachyon's rise, at saving his parents because he's listening to his family and doing what's right, right now. Azimuth, ever the cool-headed dude that he is, takes rejection well. General? And since he's gone, you know what that means, another Captain Quark level. Ratchet, Clank, and Quark infiltrate the Nefarious space station in disguise, but Nefarious catches them in the act of sabotaging the station and its docked ships. As a fitting piece of revenge, he attaches the duo to an asteroid and flings them into space, but they're saved from crash landing by the Zoni in a jar. This swampy, desolate planet they're stranded on was once home to the Fongoids, but about a decade ago, those pesky invading Argorians decided to wage war just because. With no way off this planet, no way to catch up to Nefarious before he assaults the Great Clock and maybe destroys all of the universe, Clank contacts Sigmund and asks him to call a cab. Oh wait, no, he has Sigmund open a time portal up to the exact time 10 years ago that this planet was invaded, to the Battle of Gimlik Valley. Okay, let's put aside the fact that going back several years in time and changing the outcome of a multi-species war is okay if Clank does it, great rules by the way guys, if Clank can just contact Sigmund like this from anywhere in the galaxy, he can definitely chat with Ratchet. Most of this game could have been avoided. Like with Xanafar before, the gameplay extent of this level's time travel is limited to growing vines, and yet again, as a result of the limited memory available when superimposing two versions of the very same level, or in this case, three versions, this is easily the flattest, smallest, least interesting level layout in the entire game, made all the better by the battle itself being the single greatest experience grind in the franchise. With the end of the game right around the corner, a crack in time just heaves everything at you. It's gotta be a hundred enemies, each granting tons of experience so that you're guaranteed to level up everything. Let me repeat, everything. If it wasn't so laughably satisfying watching your weapons blast through five full levels in 30 seconds, it would be sad. Once you walk like 15 or 20 feet across this very tiny battlefield, you free the trapped villagers, and you defeat all the Argorians, you'll plant some vines in the past, ride them through the present, and then back into the past on top of the village's dam, and you'll fight the Argorian leader, who is now a chump thanks to all of your newly maxed out weapons. But that's only two versions of this level. Once you win, you've created an alternate good future that overwrites the course of history, which... That kind of goes against everything that Clank was just preaching about time travel, but at this point the wheels have already been long off this car for pretty much the entire game, so I, I don't really care. The duo, now back in the modified present, uses the salvaged Argorian ship to rush back to the nefarious space station and square off one final time against the good Doctor. 
as inarguably pointless as that Gimlik Valley detour was, just the most fillery of filler levels imaginable that somehow also shatters every single rule that this very game had just said about time travel, this nefarious fight afterwards is so good, so full of spectacle that I've already forgotten what we were talking about. Who are you? What begins with the space station's lasers trapping you on a small strip of runway while Nefarious rains hellfire down on you from above quickly evolves into Ratchet boosting down the crumbling space station hull as the lasers chase you from behind, annihilating everything behind you, culminating with an incredibly close quarters battle on top of one of the flying saucers. After his defeat, one too many hits to his cracked skull straight up kills Nefarious. And if you didn't think he was dead before, the flying saucer then rams right into the station and explodes, with Lawrence ejecting in the escape pod and Ratchet and Clank leaping to safety thanks to Azimuth conveniently showing up to save the day. Nefarious though, nah, that guy's dead for real. He's… he's never coming back. Shut up. Of course, there's one thing left to wrap up. What happened to Max Apogee? Oh wait, no, no, not that, forget about that. We jump to Ratchet, Clank, and Alistair in The Great Clock, where Clank's preparing to say his final goodbyes to his best friend before starting his new 9 to 5. Remember, Clank is apparently the kind of motherfucker to just ghost his friends, so this is definitely goodbye for real, forever. However, Alistair can't reconcile the idea that he's come so close to redemption only for all of his work to amount to nothing. His work of sitting around for 20 years or whatever. Filled with rage at the idea of coming up short, he… he kills Ratchet, leaving Clank completely shocked as the now final Lombax in the universe races towards the Orvis Chamber, ready to turn back the clock. With Sigmund valiantly holding Azimuth off and doing his duty as one of the clock's caretakers, Clank is able to barricade himself inside the chamber, where he struggles with the idea of turning back time just for a second to save his best friend, the person who had saved him so many times in the past. The clock, much like time itself, is a gift and not to be tampered with. Are you kidding me? You think I'd leave my best pal out here alone? Your father went to great lengths to protect this room from those who would abuse it. I wouldn't risk any more than six minutes. Six minutes? Oh, yeah, Chekhov's plumber's advice came back in this game, too. I, I didn't mention that earlier, because it's fucking stupid. So that's what Clank does. He turns back time just a few minutes to push Ratchet out of the way of Azimuth's would-be kill shot. It's pretty cool, leading to Ratchet and Clank teaming up one final time again, but this time for real, I mean it, to stop the general at all costs. You already know how this one's gonna end. Azimuth's entire journey has meant that this can only go one way with him turning back the clock, seeing the very fabric of existence start to break around him, and after a stellar, heartbreaking final boss fight, realizing too little too late that Clank is always right. How many goddamn times? Even if you think it did absolutely nothing else this entire time, a crack in time perfectly sticks the landing. Seriously, this whole section is amazing. This fight just rules, because it's one of the only bosses, really, in the entire Ratchet & Clank franchise that doesn't just stick to the tried-and-true big three of Ratchet boss moves. The shockwave attack, the sweeping floor laser, and the missile barrage from above. Instead, Azimuth will zoom around the circular chamber on his hover boots faster than your camera can keep up. He'll deflect every shot you have back at you, even the rhino, by spinning his wrench. He'll grab pieces of the clock's equipment and just heave them at you. He's so different from any other Ratchet boss fight, thank god, and that's what makes him so menacing if you're not careful. But, like I said, this was only ever going to end one way. After the fight, Alistair sees the damage that he's caused, and since the Orvis Chamber's lever has broken off, he finally gets to be that martyr that he's always wanted to be. Take care of yourself, Ratchet! He did a brave thing, Ratchet. You should be proud of him.
For a saga designed from day one to give Ratchet an idea of who he was, it leaves him with so many more questions than answers, with so much more pain in his heart, and thanks to Clank being a time god now for some fucking reason, it leaves him completely alone. Except for Talon, but she's not here right now and her voicemail box is full. If there's one thing Azimuth was dead on about, the universe can have a cruel sense of humor. The future series ends up boldly answering questions that nobody ever had about Clank, and it's too afraid to answer anything that it asked about Ratchet, leading to all of these dropped plot threads. Like, remember at the end of Tools of Destruction when Tachyon says that he knows Ratchet's real name and purpose, and Clank says, I detected no lie in his voice. Oh yeah, Clank's a lie detector too. It's pretty cool. They never follow up this teaser. That was dropped because it was feared that revealing Ratchet's name would inherently change who he was as a character and maybe spell the end of the series. That's the carrot that's been dangled in front of players since 2007, to some extent even up until Rift Apart. But that's a load of shit, and let me tell you why. First, Insomniac kept pushing this idea during this game's production and during the marketing push for A Crack in Time that this was going to be the last Ratchet & Clank game, so why pull back at the very last second? Second, it didn't have to fundamentally change his character. For Ratchet to learn his true name, respond to that by saying, well, that's nice, I'm happy that I finally have that bit of closure, but at the end of the day, I grew up as Ratchet. That's who I am, that's who I'm gonna be. That would show more character growth than what a crack in time gives him, and it would be far better than our hero of 78,000 games up until that point, suddenly deciding to spectate someone else's quest to die. For God's sake, in a crack in time, Clank gets to learn his true name, his second true name, since we hear his serial number all the way back in Ratchet 1. Clank learns his purpose. It's some piece of weird cosmic humor that he gets the closure that Ratchet's always wanted that Clank never asked for. For Ratchet to be a sort of last child chosen one of sorts was one thing, but we didn't need both of them to be that. We didn't need Clank to be a time god, it just writes everything into a corner, and now, in every subsequent game, we have to pretend that he's not this super powerful being that can warp the flow of time itself. Or we have to deal with this weird power scaling where he gets progressively more ridiculous because there's this fear of him getting stale in a series where the games have barely changed for two decades. I thought it was funny when they gave him some room to expand and made him a movie star and a ladies man because that was a new wrinkle to his character that contrasted with Ratchet, but since then Clank's become a time god which they've barely referenced since, he can traverse into the nether realm which they've never referenced since, he's most recently become Schrodinger's Clank and I can guarantee you they're not gonna reference that next time around when since day one I've said that he was one thing and that thing was more than good enough. I've said it in all of these videos so I know you can say it with me this time, come on. Clank's a robot, and you're not going to say it with me. What am I doing? That's pretty cool. Oh my god. You guys said it with me. I just, I can't help but feel that as mountainous as the future saga's peaks can get, it failed at its chief mission statements. In telling a story that would explain our hero's origins, we got a basic idea that still hasn't been delivered on. There's an excellent theme buried down underneath this entire mess of a story, where this mid-twenties, college-aged dude is going through a crisis of identity, really wanting to find out who he is. If you look at the evolution of Ratchet from this callous teen boy into an actual adult, it's surprisingly a remarkably solid story arc that touches on things that every kid goes through, but it's left so far out of the picture here that I can't even call it intentional, and I certainly can't call it incredibly written. We ended up with Ratchet suddenly becoming a relatively voiceless character throughout this game here. Somebody who is talked at instead of the guy that's always done the talking. You know what? I'll fucking say it. Ratchet's character is generally more aligned in All for One than in this game. Get mad, I'm right, and better yet, the Future Saga's best story isn't even one of the games, it's the 2010 comic book that most players never even read. At least there, we finally get to see Ratchet deal and cope with all that he's been through since Ratchet won, instead of just be talked at. As much as they may try to paint him as one, and as tragic as his story may be, General Azimuth, through his fairly limited actions and interactions, isn't exactly a mentor for Ratchet. He's just a guy. He's just a guy that vaguely clues him into the past, and the Lombax story, again, the point of this saga, may as well have died unsolved with his death. Right as Ratchet's about to leave, Clank declines his role as the Great Clock's caretaker, because Ratchet's his family just as much as his weird dad made of pure energy and his mom who's a robot factory, and whatever Clank's purpose may be, he can't leave his pal alone until Ratchet finds out his purpose. 
It's a beautiful moment, with the added bonus of Sigmund getting the ending he deserves. Sigmund is just awesome. Hope you're excited about the fact that he's never referenced again. Yippee! This sort of ending is also a great way to keep the door open for any future games that Insomniac was allegedly unsure would ever happen. Except that's misleading at best, and I would argue that as far as some of the studio was concerned, it may have been an outright lie, since the next Ratchet game, All For One, started development mere months after a Crack in Times production began, when Insomniac's new North Carolina location opened in January 2009. I'll save that part of the story for another day, but considering that a Ratchet & Clank action figure line was announced in March 2009, I would be shocked if Sony hadn't made it clear to Insomniac by the time that Kraken Time started production that this series wasn't stopping. And of course, don't get me wrong, I'm glad that Ratchet & Clank didn't end with a crack in time, both because more of these games will always be a treat to me, even ones like this one that I may not love but are still fine, but also because the future saga left far too much on the table, and to me, as great as a crack in time's ending is, it wouldn't have ended the series on a high note, but as a disappointment. Look, I could keep going, but I'm not going to tear into this game any further, because what would that do? It's not fun for me, it's not fun for many of you, I'm sure, and I've already more than made my point. Anything further is just going to serve to upset the people that do really love this game, or this new perspective might change your own feelings on it. That's... That's not really what I want. The videos that I make are always meant to raise a game up in the end, and hopefully help you find a newfound respect in them. Given how awful its development was, if you haven't gained more respect for a crack in time, I don't know what to tell you. This ended up being a project of pure frustration, something that I've loathed making, because I want this to be the best Ratchet game, just like it is for so many of you, but it's just not for me. I wanted so hard to finally see the magic in full. I did everything I could. To pull back the curtain a bit on this whole video series, I recorded my gameplay for Ratchets 1 through 3 as far back as a year ago, almost to the day. I beat the first two PS3 Ratchets before Ratchet 2's video was even out. For a crack in time? I didn't play it until about a month ago. I went out of my way to take a break and throw myself into a completely different project so that I wouldn't burn out, so that I could come in 100% fresh and hope that I saw this game differently than I have every time I've played it before. And I came out feeling exactly the same about the game that we got, and separately, thanks to all of my research into its development, I came out more frustrated about the one that we could have had, more frustrated for a studio that tried so hard, that put its all into everything that it was doing, but that could have used just a single break. I feel so much for the team that broke its back making this game, that went all out adding all of these features at first thinking that this might be their last hurrah, that thanks to lower sales projections, this might be where the series would cap off. I truly mean this. I hope the reward was worth the consequence, that the accolades were worth that stress, because for pure work alone, they deserved a medal. In some weird way, I'm glad that this ended up being a breaking point, as Resistance 3 received a much-needed year-long delay from 2010 to 2011 so that Insomniac wouldn't have to rush out yet another game in a matter of months. I'm glad that Insomniac continued focusing on their company culture so that this sort of stuff would eventually never happen again. And hate the spin-offs all that you want, I'm glad that the team finally got the chance to scale down and experiment with smaller Ratchet titles that didn't have these unsustainably increasing stakes on shorter and shorter deadlines. I just wish it came sooner, not for the sake of the products that we would have gotten, but for the well-being of the team that made so many of the games that so many of us love. I just hate that I don't like so many of these ideas. I hate that I get bored two or three levels in every time I try to give it another shot. I hate that I've got to pick apart a game that so many folks hold in such high regard. But I've done it with my favorite games in this franchise too. They've all gotten this same time under the microscope so far, and I know that you folks deserve that same level of honesty now. So as much as I wish I could shower this game with praise, I don't make exceptions. And I'll remind you one more time that no matter how critical I may be when I hold this game to its own standards, I don't hold that shortcoming against this game given how much the team had to scrape together with so little. 
putting aside that I don't love it, this game has no right to be as good as it is for as ambitious as it is when it was developed in less time than every previous full-sized Ratchet game because of every previous Ratchet game setting expectations higher and higher. That perspective is everything. But just imagine if they could have taken their time. We end off what could have been the final Ratchet & Clank game with our heroes sticking together, looking towards an uncertain future in the cosmos, certain that as long as they had their family, it'd all be alright. For as much as A Crack in Time can struggle to hit its beats, this is one of my favorite game endings ever, every time it gets me. For as patchwork as the future story sadly ended up being, TJ Fixman absolutely nailed those themes of duality, because maybe the universe's sense of humor isn't cruel. Maybe it's just that perspective, how you perceive it, that matters. Or, as Orvis says, maybe my favorite line in any video game ever. The universe has a wonderful sense of humor. The trick is learning how to take a joke. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your time with me today. If you're new here and you made it this far, I'm gonna venture a guess and say maybe you liked the video, so make sure to subscribe to keep up to date with all new videos that I put out as they drop. I know that there's gonna be a lot of conversation down in the comments, and I look forward to hearing your perspective either on what I've said or on this game in general. While you're writing those long essays, though, I've got another essay for you. As in, Essay 1, Sonic Adventure. It's a game I recently learned to love. You should toss that video on in the background while you write. Last, but certainly not least, I'd like to give a very special thanks to my wonderful Patreon supporters who help bring projects like this to life, including, and I'm gonna try and do this in one breath again, Goldstorm07, Alex Moretti, Anon42, Gianni Grand, Philly D360, The FOE3, Vincent, Adonis Alexander, Bahari, Calico Plus, Eclipse 2025, Even Luck, Harry Baker, Hosey, Ibithon, Jay's Reviews, James Boss, Justin Gregoire, The Milkman, Rodney220, Tabriz Sadiq, Terminally Nerdy, Wolf Chaos on Dervinator, and Buckles Chuck Lowe. I won this time. If you're feeling especially generous and you'd like to see me pass out trying to do this in one breath next time, you can support at patreon.com slash thegoldenbolt. You'll even get early access to videos and ad-free videos, so pretty worth it. Thank you again, and as always, until next time, stay golden.